Good afternoon, History 259. Um, good to see you, not through Zoom, unfortunately, but through video. Uh, you should all know by now that I, through email, that I had a Zoom problem. So it didn't seem like it would be working and I didn't want to take a chance. So I just went ahead and recorded this. Uh, this will suffice for this week. Um, this week, there will still be a discussion board response and uh, I'll post that on Wednesday. Uh, your responses for last week I've read through. Uh, you can look at the grades on Blackboard under uh, Grade Center. So that's where you can find that. Uh, and so that should be all the administrative stuff I have to talk about. Uh, so I'll just dive into the topic, uh, which is, uh, as I said in our Zoom class last week, kind of a little bit going to be a meld of uh, what we were talking about at the end of last class uh, and uh the subject for this week, which is the Seven Years' War. And so the point of, of today and the point of the reading is to sort of set us up for what will begin next week, which is the uh, the events that led uh, directly to the American Revolution. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk for maybe 30 minutes. I don't want to make a super, super long video. Um, and I do miss our discussions that we have in class, but we'll, we'll get back to it next week. Uh, and I'll be referring to, to Alan Taylor, American Revolutions, in which you all wrote really, not all, many of you, wrote really nice uh, discussion board responses to, and, and also in response to the Patriot uh, clips that you chose. And, uh, so I'm glad that we're thinking about this book, uh, American Revolutions. And I kind of want to break up uh, what I have to say today into two pieces, and they correspond roughly with... Uh, the readings from last week and this week. So as you know, last week I asked us to read uh, all the way through uh, the end of the chapter that's called Colonies, and here I am referring to my book, which ends on page 53, and then for today I asked us to read through page 65, uh, the beginning of the chapter called Land. And again, this is really sort of to set us up for, oops, excuse me, knock my computer, um, to set us up for what will really be the meat of the first chunk of the class, uh, which is the events leading to and ultimately the revolution. So um, I think where I want to start with is with one of Alan Taylor's core contentions. Uh, of course, we discussed the overarching themes of the book uh, last class uh, in Zoom, or last uh, Wednesday, I should say. So I kind of want to pick up with that and, and uh, talk about some of the major themes that, that he brings up in uh, the chapter called Colonies, and then we'll get to uh, the subject of uh, the Seven Years' War uh, at the end of this little talk. Um, and the first point that I would make, and it's one that fits in with the larger, the largest point that Alan Taylor makes in American Revolutions, which is that we collectively, or at the very least in terms of popular memory, uh, until fairly recently, have really been misinterpreting uh, the... American Revolution, and in this case, uh, the, the case called Colonies, uh, we've been misinterpreting as a collective, again, in popular memory, of what exactly the North American colonies were like uh, before the American Revolution, uh, and the ways in which the very, and this is the key point, diverse populations uh, of the North American colonies will help us understand, moving forward, the origins of the American Revolution and the events of, in fact, the War for Independence. And the first point to bring up, and, and this is really the core theme of the chapter entitled Colonies, uh, is the sheer diversity of the colonies. Um, and the reason he makes this point, and it's a point that's well taken, is that sometimes there's a there's a, a tendency or an instinct to kind of collapse together the 13 North American colonies uh, and treat them as if they're roughly the same uh, and nothing could further be further from the truth. In fact, as the chapter called Colonies attests, uh, they were very different, they were very complex, and they did not always uh, reflect the same interests. So the diversity that he sees is social, we could say socioeconomic diversity, uh, racial diversity, uh, and some diversity in their economies. And so that's third of the order that I'm going to go in. And the first point that I would start with, and which is the subject of a huge chunk of the first part of the chapter, is just a survey of the different regions of British colonization of the Americas. And, and the, the, the idea of diversity should jump right out at you uh, as you go geographically from the farthest north, New England, 
uh, along the northern Atlantic seaboard. And actually, I should note, even farther north of New England, which is Canada. Uh, and then you move southward down the eastern seaboard into New York and Pennsylvania, and then farther south into uh, Maryland and Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and then move farther down to the south of that and move into the Caribbean. Uh, what we see are colonial regions that are effectively bound by only one thing, and it's just the fact that they were colonial regions of the British Empire. In almost every other respect, uh, they were quite different. And that's the key theme of the chapter called Colonies. Uh, and the reason I, I think, and I agree with this uh, contention of Alan Taylor, that he emphasizes the point of sheer diversity uh, is in part to push back on the idea that we talked about last week that he mentions in his introduction, which is that we shouldn't expect there have been, that we shouldn't expect there to have been, say that fast three times, a uniform response to the events that would lead to the American Revolution, which began really in the year 1763. Uh, and that's where we'll pick up next week. Uh, why shouldn't we expect there to have been a uniform response? Well, because the colonies themselves uh, were, them, were very different. Uh, and in terms of thinking about how the colonies viewed themselves and how the colonists viewed themselves, uh, I think a key point to make, and one that runs throughout the first chapter called Colonies, uh, but what I just want to make very clearly right now, uh, is the way that British colonists in North America, not to mention uh, the Caribbean, uh, identified themselves. Uh, before the 1760s, and, and really before the year 1763, which for reasons we'll discuss uh, next week, are the, the official or traditional beginning of the origins of the American Revolution, um, they, they being the North American colonists, uh, and those particularly of European descent, just to be clear, uh, did not consider themselves to be Americans in the way that we would understand that today. Uh, and that's not just because there was no American nation to which one could be a citizen before the American Revolution, but it is because of the fact that they viewed themselves primarily as subjects of the British king. In the case of the 1750s, uh, it's King George II, uh, after 1760, his son, King George III. Uh, so their primary identification was as a, was as a subject of the British Empire, uh, subject being the term for, for citizen. Uh, they secondarily identified themselves not as Americans, but as residents of particular colonies or uh, 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 born and raised in particular colonies. So that if we could somehow go back into the 17, let's say 1750, just to pick a round number, uh, and we could, if we were to walk around and ask people in New York City, for example, what they identified themselves as, uh, they first would have said British subjects. And if you had pushed them further, uh, they would have identified, if they were actually born in, born in New York, they would have identified themselves as New York colonists. Uh, they wouldn't have said American. Uh, there was no sense of an American identity uh, before the American Revolution. And as we know, not all Americans, as we discussed last week during the war itself, actually supported American independence. But the basic fact was that the primary allegiance that people in North America had uh, was to the British Empire, but even more specifically to the monarchy. Uh, and that's a really important point. And it will help us understand some of their responses that we'll get into next week when we discuss, especially the primary source documents that I've assigned for us uh, next week and the week after. Uh, and this is just foreshadowing, but one of the things that's always kind of confusing to people when they're first learning about uh, statements, uh, for example, in 1765 against the Stamp Act, or even all the way up until the Declaration of Independence itself, uh, declarations made in 1775, the year before the de Declaration of Independence, uh, there's always some confusion about why uh, protesting colonists, and as we know, not all were protesting, but uh, those who were, uh, also known as patriots, there's some confusion by the, the language in these uh, petitions and these declarations of grievances, uh, which is to say that as late as the year before the Declaration of Independence, people protested the British Empire for reasons that we'll talk about, but didn't protest the king. They protested parliament, uh, parliament being the lawmaking legislative body uh, of the British Empire. Uh, and that's, if you're not familiar, still true today. Uh, Great Britain is primarily ruled by parliament. Uh, so the fact that North Americans viewed the king 
uh, in general in an extremely positive way, but even not the individual kings themselves necessarily, King George II up until 1760, King George III after 1760, they viewed the institution of the monarchy uh, as, as sacred. Um, and that's a little bit surprising sometimes for people to learn, but it's but it's true. Uh, it's the one thing that bound the North American colonists together uh, was uh, in law in general. Of course, there are always exceptions, but in general, it's the one uh, common trait of identity that, that that again bound together the North American colonists. Um, in many, in and in fact, most other respects, there was little to bind them together. Uh, one point that's worth making that isn't necessarily mentioned in the chapter called Colonies, but it's one that's worth bringing up, is that uh, there, there was a simple fact that people in, uh, let's just pick the region of New England, so let's pick Massachusetts as the largest colony in New England. Uh, people in Massachusetts are very, very seldomly, the vast majority of people in a colony like Massachusetts, but very seldom came into contact with somebody from, say, Virginia. Uh, who, which, as you know, is quite quite a long distance away. Um, the reason for that is because of limit, limitations in transportation. There was no real good road system, uh, and therefore the quickest way to travel up and down the Atlantic seaboard is indeed by water. But even having said that, except for a small number of people who were sailors, for example, uh, who, of course, then operated ships in the Atlantic Ocean as they traveled to various points between North America and Europe and North America and uh, other parts of the eastern seaboard, or even North America and the Caribbean or Africa, while there were people who engaged in commerce, and, and Alan Taylor makes a good point that the North American colonies were very commercial, very oriented towards trade on the eve of the American Revolution, yet there was surprisingly little contact between people from the different colonies themselves, especially if they didn't border each other. So, for example, it wouldn't have been uh, that... Uh, uncommon for somebody to travel from New York to Pennsylvania, right, because they share a border uh, and they're not, and therefore they're contiguous. But the idea that people in Virginia would really know much at all about people from Massachusetts or that people in North Carolina would know much about people from Connecticut, uh, it just didn't occur. And so people didn't identify themselves as North American because there was no real reason to. Uh, people in Connecticut were just as foreign to people in Virginia as people in Ireland were foreign to people in Virginia. And in fact, people in Virginia were probably more acquainted with Irish people through Irish immigrants coming to Virginia than they were with people from Connecticut. The this, this sheer fact of distance is something that, a point that I want to make uh, because there is a tendency, and this is something Alan Taylor pushes back on, uh, there is a tendency to uh, assume that there's some sort of American-ness, some sort of American identity before the American Revolution, which helped lead to American independence. And the truth is that that's incorrect. Uh, and so that's a major point. Um, the diversity between the colonies took many different forms. Uh, so I'll talk about the most, to me, the most important one, which is the institution of slavery. And that's something that Alan Taylor, <clears throat> as I pull up in my copy of American Revolutions, uh, discusses on pages don't know why I had, had this bookmarked and then I lost it. Uh, discusses on pages, sorry, bear with me as I flip backwards. There we go. All right, okay, there we go. Uh, pages uh, 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, the differences of the North American colonies as they pertain to slavery. Um, so slavery existed in all of the North American colonies. In fact, in all of the British Empire, slavery was technically legal. Uh, nowhere was it illegal. And that's because that was a long-standing policy uh, of the British Empire, uh, but especially of uh, the king uh, and parliament, that uh, slavery would be legal in all, of the North, uh, in all of the American colonies, not just North America, but also including the Caribbean. Uh, ironically and paradoxically, at the same time, slavery by the 1750s and 1760s, sort of the period that we're running up to before we begin our discussion next week, uh, paradoxically, slavery was actually uh, by and large illegal in England itself, in the mother country, so that there's this odd situation, this paradox where slavery is illegal in the mother country, this is my attempt to do the British Isles up here, uh, but legal in all of the British colonies. Having said that, however, 
the significance of slavery and therefore the significance of, excuse me, uh, of uh, racial politics was very different throughout the colonies. Um, in, as Alan Taylor says, and this is on page 21 in particular, um, slavery was, if we work northward to southward, uh, more and more prevalent and more and more significant the farther south one traveled. So if you were to start in all the way north in what today is Maine, the state of Maine, which at the time was just a part of the Massachusetts colony, slavery was basically non-existent. Um, there were very few European settlers, uh, people of European descent settling uh, in what is now Maine, mostly Native Americans, but even not that many Native Americans. It was largely unsettled territory. Um, as you move south from Maine, you get into colonies like uh, New Hampshire uh, and what would become Vermont, which was a part of New York before the American Revolution. Uh, slavery, uh, a very, 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 very minimal presence. And, and in, a, in a colony like New Hampshire, now the state of New Hampshire, I mean, you're literally talking about less than 100 people who were held as uh, enslaved people. The farther south you continue to go into Massachusetts and Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, you see a slow uptick. But at no point before the American Revolution uh, through New England was the slave population greater than 2%. That's 2% of the entire population. So it just gives you a sense of scale. It was comparatively insignificant. Um, I think I mentioned this last class. Sometimes it's said because uh, that, the, that the relative uh, lack of uh, the institution of slavery in a place like New England was because there couldn't be plantation economies uh, as there could farther in the South. For example, in Virginia, where tobacco was the main uh, commodity crop uh, forcibly grown by slaves, uh, or in the Caribbean where sugar uh, was the main commodity crop for some grown by slaves. Uh, but that's not even necessarily true. It's, it's, it's something that people just assume to be true, but it's actually not. It's because of a deeper history in Massachusetts in particular of not wanting slavery as an institution. Sometimes people forget that slaves uh, could be forced to work on any kind of uh, economic activity, not just working on a plantation. But as you move farther south from New England, you start to see higher and higher rates of, slave, of slavery. So that in a colony like New York, for example, slave population hovered around 10% of the population. And most of that concentrated in uh, New York City, the Hudson Valley, and Long Island. Uh, Pennsylvania, about the same. Uh, but as you move farther into the Chesapeake colonies, and Virginia in particular, is where you really start to see the slave population grow larger. In Virginia in the 1750s, about 35%. Uh, and as you go farther south into a colony like uh, South Carolina, uh, that reached uh, 45%, so just about less than half. Uh, and uh, if you stretch it out farther to the south of the Caribbean, you see that a slave population in a colony like Barbados, for example, uh, was about 90%, 9-0, just to give you a sense of scale. So that's one major difference. Uh, and, I, and I bring this up at length now because we're going to tackle the subject of slavery in the context of the American Revolution and especially the ideology of the American Revolution and the uh, emphasis on concepts like freedom and liberty and equality. Um, so I just want to bring that up now. Um, another way in which you see diversity uh, is religious diversity. Um, and that's not to say that uh, North America uh, before the American Revolution was the host to people uh, who adherents of all world religions, like, for example, uh, uh, almost no Muslims in North America, uh, only a very small number of Jews in colonial North America. And, and they're concentrated uh, almost entirely in urban areas like New York City, for example. But a wide diversity of uh, especially Protestant Christian denominations, many of which had significant conflicts with each other. Uh, by the 1750s, uh, especially through the work of a man whose name, who's discussed and named uh, in the chapter called Colonies named George Whitefield. Uh, he is discussed, uh, let me find that page. I had all these marked and now I don't know where they are. Uh, he's discussed uh, on page 30, yes, 30 and 29, 30, 31. Uh, George Whitefield uh, was a uh, uh, itinerant preacher who uh, preached the message of the Great Awakening, this evangelical Christian revival of the 1730s and 40s. And so 
because of the efforts of people like George Whitefield, who traveled throughout North America, literally all the way north, all the way south multiple times, by the eve of the American Revolution, you had quite a, quite a large number of evangelical Christians. Um, and, and evangelical Christians in the 18th century, not to say anything about evangelical Christians today, but in the 18th century tended to come from a broader array of socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, evangelical evangelical uh, denominations in uh, the mid uh, mid eighteenth century tend to appeal to, to sort of poorer classes of people, uh, and also to enslaved people and free people of color, uh, in addition to women. Uh, so that was a major uh, religious uh, contour uh, that was accompanied by uh, more traditional, longer standing Christian denominations. Uh, so, for example, uh, some colonies uh, and here. Maryland is the best example, uh, were heavily Catholic. Uh, you can find a significant number of Catholics as well throughout the North American colonies. Uh, you could also find many Anglicans, uh, adherents to the official church of the British Empire called the Church of England. Uh, and especially in colonies like Virginia and North Carolina, you find large numbers of Anglicans. Um, you could find people from various other uh, Protestant Christian denominations uh, that were a little bit more radical in their beliefs. And here the best example is Quakerism and Quakers, uh, who, if you're familiar with the origins of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania was founded as a Quaker uh, colony, a quote-unquote holy experiment that welcomed people from a diverse array of religious backgrounds. Uh, and I could go on and on about the different ways in which uh, there was a diversity of faith, a diversity of economy, uh, and a diversity of uh, identity uh, throughout North America. Um, I now, just for the last couple of minutes, want to push forward and begin to talk about uh, the Seven Years War or the French and Indian War, uh, which was the proximate cause for the troubles that ultimately led to uh, an independence movement in North America and eventually the American Revolution itself. And, and, and this is, um, uh, it's an interesting point that Alan Taylor uh, discusses the Seven Years' War uh, in a chapter at the end of the chapter called Colonies, but it, more directly in a chapter called Land, because that is what the the, Ameri the, the French and Indian War um, was about. And, and before I get into that, I just want to make a point about nomenclature, about names. Uh, the French and Indian War was the name for the local North American portion of a conflict that was a larger global war uh, that Europeans called the Seven Years War. So I'll use those names interchangeably. Um, if we're focusing on North Americans, they refer to it as the French and Indian War, uh, the names of their enemies, the French uh, and their Native American allies. Uh, but again, Europeans refer to it as the Seven Years War. And this is really where we see one of the third major theme that I talked about last week with you on our Zoom call on Wednesday emerge, which is the theme of taking a continental view uh, of the origins of and progress eventually of the American Revolution. As we zoom out and we think about North America as a land mass as a whole, and here you could look at the map across from page 59 to just sort of get a sense for the different land claims as of 1763, uh, then what we can see is that the causes of the American Revolution were continental in scale. And just a little bit of background about what caused the French and Indian slash Seven Years' War. Again, you can use either. Let me just adjust my screen here. Um, the, there are deeper causes of the of the what Europeans call the Seven Years' War, uh, and those were centuries-long conflicts between Great Britain and France. Uh, traditional arch enemies. So there are much, uh, you could you could trace the roots back centuries uh, if one wanted to. Uh, this long-standing rivalry between Great Britain and France uh, had uh, been transported to North America as those nations began to plant colonies uh, in North America. Uh, I didn't talk a lot about this, but France actually colonized North America before uh, England did. Uh, all the way in, back in the 1530s when French explorers began to establish trading posts in the Great Lakes region. So if you're looking at the map on page 58 where it says Great Lakes, and I think we all probably know what the Great Lakes are, uh, that was the heart 
uh, of French settlement in North America. Uh, and you're probably familiar with Quebec, the now Canadian province, which is French speaking. Uh, that is clear, uh, uh, clearly because of the heritage of French colonization and, and, and the foundation of cities like Montreal, for example. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the British Empire had colonized the eastern seaboard. So if we're just looking at North America, we can see this long-standing conflict between Britain and France uh, playing out uh, over land claims. Uh, and these conflicts uh, had boiled up on many occasions uh, before the 1750s. And in fact, it was a common feature of life, conflicts between English settle British settlers and French settlers uh, and British settlers and settlers and their Native American allies and France and their Native American allies had bubbled up uh, and had become, as I said, a common feature of life. Uh, this all broke open in 1754 uh, when a uh, relatively young Virginia uh, militia colonel named George Washington, the George Washington, uh, was sent by the Virginia colonial government to investigate uh, land claims in and around what is today the city of Pittsburgh, so Western Pennsylvania. At the time, that region, what today is Western Pennsylvania, uh, had long been a site of conflict between French and British settlers and Native Americans who were allied with each side. Uh, the uh, geographic name for this area is the Ohio River Valley. Uh, the Ohio River Valley makes a big U sort of going northward through New England and then or southward from New England and then dipping back up before it connects to the Mississippi River. Uh, this was a hotly contested region uh, by the British and the French. And in 1754, George Washington being sent to investigate uh, British land claims, uh, stumbled into igniting a war with France uh, and its Indian allies, uh, hence the name uh, that North Americans called the war, the French and Indian War. Um, this war quickly mushroomed out into uh, what his military historians tend to call the First World War, uh, not World War I, of course, from the 20th century. What they mean by that is the First War that was fought by combatants and their allies, Great Britain and its allies, France and its allies, at the same time, so simultaneously, on multiple continents. That's why militarians, uh, historians will, will call this the First World War. So it began officially in North America. It soon triggered fighting back in Europe, which is where the vast majority of the largest battles occurred. Uh, the fighting in, in North America uh, in the overall scale of the war was relatively minor. Uh, the war was also fought at the same time in the Caribbean between, uh, of course, France and Britain and their allies. Uh, it touched on Africa. There was a, a fight over control of slave trading ports uh, along the West African coast, uh, it touched on South America as well. So this really did touch uh, North America, Caribbean, South America, Africa, Europe, hence the name the First World War. And without going into too much detail, and you can find this detail, especially on pages 59, 60, and 61, um, the war ended officially in 1763 uh, with Britain being victorious. Uh, winning in this, again, quote-unquote, First World War uh, over France. And the, the outcomes of this war were many, uh, too many to go into for our purposes today. Uh, the most important result of this war, in this I'll again refer you to the map across from page 59, uh, is that all French territory in North America became British uh, as a part of this treaty. Uh, and that meant that Canada, which before the French and Indian War uh, had been officially French territory, now became British territory. So British North America expands dramatically from a relatively sliver, well, slice of the Eastern seaboard uh, to a many, 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 many times larger landmass reaching, if you look at that map on page 58, I guess, uh, all the way up into Northern Canada and all the way west to the Mississippi River. At the same time, uh, the, uh, there was a Native American uh, uprising or a war is probably the more appropriate word uh, 
British North Americans, white North Americans called it an uprising at the time, that emerged also in 1763 as the Seven Years' War officially ended, uh, called Pontiac's War or Pontiac's Rebellion. Uh, and this is discussion on pages 59 and 60, uh, a war in which, excuse me, uh, Native Amer an alliance of Native American tribes from the Ohio River Valley attempted to force British colonists press them back eastwards as much as possible to prevent their westward expansion. So the year 1763 is a very important one for not just American history, but uh, let's say Atlantic or world history. It's the end of the Seven Years' War. It's the beginning of Pontiac's War. It's also the very beginning of policies passed by the British imperial government that began to alienate small numbers of North American colonists, which eventually would snowball into an independence movement. And the most important of these is the Proclamation of 1763, uh, a primary source document that uh, had we been meeting through Zoom, we would have all read through together, but we can't do that today uh, because we're I'm recording a video. Uh, the Proclamation of 1763 uh, is traditionally viewed by historians like myself as the beginning step not inevitably towards an American independent nation, but the first step in generating colonial grievances on the part of some, right? Remembering that uh, not every single colonist in North America supported independence eventually. It's the very beginning step in what would become the events leading to the American Revolution. And this proclamation of 1763 was quite simple. It was proclaimed by King George III, who at that point had only been king for three years. Uh, he was receiving reports from North America, from his colonial governors, governors appointed by the British Empire to govern the individual colonies, uh, and other officials, uh, alarming reports about the growing war prosecuted by Pontiac, the military leader of, again, this alliance of Native American tribes, which waged war to prevent British North Americans from expanding westward. As he received more and more reports, uh, he determined that he was going to prevent, he being King George III, uh, prevent his subjects in North America from migrating westward. Why? To prevent conflict with Native Americans. And this is an important step because this is the first time that some colonists in North America began to question British imperial policy, but policy that directly came from the King of England, King George III. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, but I'll, I'll tell you that I want you to read the Proclamation of 1763 uh, in part because the discussion board for this week will will focus on it. So go ahead and reread it if you haven't, re or read it if you haven't yet, but reread it if you already have. And on Wednesday, uh, I will post that discussion board response. Uh, and in the meantime, have a good rest of your day. Uh, again, sorry, Zoom wasn't cooperating, but here's hoping, okay, uh, that it will next week. Okay, thank you.